It's only game three, but we kind of got the full Mariners experience tonight. Some magnificent pitching, a lot of frustrating offense, and of course, chaos ball. Our thoughts on the Mariners 4-3 to three walk-off win over the Red Sox coming up here on the Locked On Mariners postgame show. Colby, hit it. You are Locked On Mariners, your daily Seattle Mariners podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ahoy, sailors. It is Saturday, March 30th, 2024. This is Tiny Gonzalez and Colby Patnode for the Locked On Mariners postgame show. Thank you so much for making us your first listen after the Mariners 4-3 to victory over the Boston Red Sox. Subscribe, like, and turn on alerts if you're watching on YouTube, or subscribe and leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform if you like what you hear. And if you're part of the crew and rock with us every single day, let us know in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. And if you want to hear from us even more, please consider signing up for our Patreon. You can now get a free seven day trial to check out the show. The link as well as our social accounts is in the description of this episode. And I am congested. I am also about half an hour removed from taking a full dose of NyQuil. So this is going to be a lot of fun. But, you know, we had to do a post-gamer after this one. This was a uh, really fascinating game on a multitude of levels. Um, and this didn't feel like a game the Mariners were ultimately meant to win. But, alas, here we are. So, let's go over this 10th inning. Uh, the Red Sox, of course, they get a pair of runs to make a 3-1 in the top half of the 10th. Uh, and given the way this Mariners offense has looked for most of the series and had looked from basically the second inning onward in this game, uh, things were looking a bit bleak, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but Seattle gets one back on a broken bat single by Luke Rayleigh. Then Josh Rojas singles and Abreu, of course, misplays the ball, uh, which then puts runners at second and third. Uh, Rayleigh then scores on the grounder by J.P., and then, of course, Julio gets his first career walk-off hit with a single in the gap. Didn't do too much. Just single in the gap. That's all the Mariners needed. That's what Julio gave them. Just beautiful stuff. So, Colby, thoughts on this win? Thoughts on that 10th inning? Yeah, it was poetry in motion um, because this is what the Mariners were supposed to be. This was what was supposed to be different about this offense versus last year's offense. And pretty much from the first inning yesterday, uh, this offense has looked eerily similar to last year's offense. Ton of strikeouts, just kind of relying on the home run. You're hoping somebody gets a walk and you hit a homer, and that's how you score. And, you know, this inning they didn't score, or this game they didn't score on a homer. Uh, that's how they, that's the only way they were able to score in their first two games. This first inning, they put the ball in play, right? They want single, they make an, they make an error, we get a base hit. Nice and easy, simple, the way baseball should be played. In the 10th inning, after eight innings, nine innings of just flailing away and just missing hangers and, and trying to hit the 480-foot bomb and all that stuff, what do we see finally with their backs against the wall? They put the ball in play. They force Boston to make plays. Boston couldn't do it. The bloop single, broken bat single, sometimes you need some good luck. You need something to change, something to turn to go your way. Not only is that hit kind of what you needed to get going, but also we should give Ty France a lot of credit on that. That was a very good piece of base running. He read the he read the ball perfectly. He knew where the defenders were. He knew they weren't going to be able to get to it. He took off right away. France, not the most fleet of foot. So the fact that he got off to that really good start, that was huge. I was stunned, right? frankly. Right. I thought he was going to stop at third. Like, okay, he had to make sure it wasn't going to get caught. And No, he read that, he read that ball perfectly. Right. And then you have Rojas come in against the lefty, by the way, Rayleigh also against the lefty uh, Rojas flips the ball into right center field after Urias hits an absolute missile right to the second baseman. That guy can't catch a break. Uh, Rojas comes in and he kind of flips a single over the right, over the second baseman's head. Right fielder comes in. Uh, he misplays the ball. He looks up to see if Rayleigh's trying to go from first to third. That's what speed does. It puts pressure on the defense. He misplays it. Rojas running hard the entire way gets to second base on the misplay as well. And that becomes huge. That is a massive uh, little note that goes unnoticed. Rojas gets into second. Now Crawford hits the ground ball, right? Routine, put the ball in play. Don't strike out. Make them make a play. And he did. And guess what? The Red Sox couldn't make the play. It was a bad throw. He kind of was back on his heels. He didn't charge the ball aggressively. 
and Luke Rayleigh is fast. We can drop the qualifier. He's not fast for his size. He's fast. He's a fast man, and he got a great jump. He, again, he didn't hesitate. He took off. That was contact play. Not a fan, but whatever. It worked this time, and he beats the throw pretty handily. I don't even know if a good throw gets him. I mean, that was just perfect. You put the ball in play. You make them get you out. You do not help them. And then Julio comes up. First pitch of the at-bat looks a lot like 2023 Julio, where you're like, oh, no, he, he's going to chase. He's going to expand, double play. Uh, but no, then he lays out. They, it was very clear what the Red Sox were trying to do. We're going to pitch around Julio. If he gets himself out, great. If he doesn't, he'll take first. We'll go after Polanco. Gets the 3-1 count, gets a pitch, doesn't get to the outside corner like it needs to, kind of stays middle away. Julio just puts a nice, simple swing on it, lines it into, into right field, and the Mariners win the game. It's the way you're built. You have the home run. You have the home run club in your bag. You can pull it out when you need it. You can hit home runs. We know this team will hit home runs. But if you can't get to that club, you have to be able to put the ball in play and put constant pressure on the defense. These are professionals, yes, but you know what your batting average is when you strike out? Zero. You know what your batting average is when you put the ball in play at all? It's about 300. So put the ball in play and good things will happen. And that's what happened in the 10th. Hopefully this carries over over the next few days. Yes, you still want them to hit home runs. Home runs are good. Okay. I Bold statement. Home runs are great. But you have to be able to win games in multiple ways. And the Mariners found a way to win tonight's game. Not with the home run ball. Not by hitting screaming doubles into the gap but by putting consistent pressure on the defense and forcing them to make plays by not handing them easy outs. So, you know, we talked a lot last year about the uh, the clutch factor for Julio, how many times that he came up late in games when the Mariners needed a, you know, a big base knock, what have you. And uh, he didn't come through, right? And it oftentimes looked like he was trying to do too much. Uh, and even earlier on in this game, the at-bat before the game-winning at-bat, he... Looked a lot like 2023 Julio gets a couple of uh, sinkers from uh, from Martin there in the top uh, inside corner of the strike zone. Fouls both of those pitches off or maybe swung through one of them, what have you, and then stares down strike three in, in the middle of the zone. Um, this is pretty huge, I think, just to kind of get the proverbial monkey off of his back. Uh, what, do, what do you think about you know what this could do for for Julio's confidence finally getting that walk off when finally being the guy right in the big moment yeah i think it's i think it's uh, you know i i don't think it it's a confidence issue i don't think Julio's going up into those situations thinking like oh i'm going to fail but i think it is just this idea that like i have to be the guy because i am the guy so if i you know, if I grip the bat a little bit harder, if I swing the bat a little bit harder, I can be the guy. And in reality, it's we just need you to do what you do. Just be a good hitter. So I don't know if this is like, I don't think this was a crisis of confidence in Julio from the last couple of years, uh, but it is just kind of a, a, reassure, a reassurance, right? Stay within yourself, do what you're capable of doing, hit the ball hard like you always do, and you'll be fine. These things will work out. Julio's not going to bat a thousand in those situations. Nobody's asking him to. Yeah. We're asking for good, solid approaches at the play, good game plans. Just try and, you know, just try and be yourself. Don't try and be something more than you could ever be. Just be yourself. Be the good hitter that you are. And that's what Julio was. Took a big aggressive hack on the first pitch, probably thought he was getting a fastball, looked ugly, but then he took three pitches that they were very clearly trying to get him to chase. And then he recognized a mistake. He didn't try to do too much. With the infield drawn in, he knows he just has to hit a ball hard and he's probably winning this game. That's exactly what he does. So I, I don't think it's a crisis of confidence thing, uh, but it is, you know, just a reassurance that, hey, like this idea of staying within myself and not trying to do too much in these situations, it works. Mm -hmm. I can do that. I It doesn't all have to be about, you know, I hit the walk off home run. I did this. I did that. I just got to have a good at bat. And the right. game will take care of itself. And that's what Julio did tonight. Let's talk about Logan Gilbert, who had a really good start. It was kind of a weird start, though. Probably the weirdest Logan Gilbert start I've watched. Uh, we'll go over that in just a moment. But first, a reminder, this episode of the Locked On Mirrors podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. 
Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on, that's L-O-C-K-D-O-N, and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. And you're listening to the Locked On Mariners postgame show. Thank you again for making us your first listen after the Mariners' 4-3 to walk-off win over the Boston Red Sox tonight. So let's talk about Logan Gilbert, who goes seven strong in this one, just gives up the one run. And this was a really weird and kind of unexpected start from Logan Gilbert. Colby, if I told you, I don't know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, that Logan Gilbert would make his debut in 2024. And from the second time through the order onward, he would mostly throw his secondaries and efficiently. So what what would you say? What would your reaction be? Oh, that's the natural progression of a future ace pitcher. I think would be my answer. Um, I think people over, I think people think Gilbert threw his fastball a lot more than he did last year, even. And he really didn't throw it all. Like he is really uh, becoming a, a mix it up type of guy. Um, and that's partly because his fastball is less effective than it was a few years ago. The league has made some adjustments on it. Mm. Um, so it, it, he has to have his other secondaries now. Uh, and thankfully tonight he did, particularly from the probably the third inning on. Um, he was just dicing up, uh, dicing up guys. And around the fifth inning, he started to find the splitter, which he didn't have much success with early. Um, but around the uh, fifth inning or so, he found the uh, he found the split, and the splitter, of course, six swings, six whiffs. Uh, for you math geniuses at home, that is a one hundred percent whiff rate uh, on the splits on the split finger fastball. So, yeah, it was a unique Logan Gilbert. The velo was down on his secondaries quite significantly, with the notable exception of his curveball. Again, this is a one outing thing, so. You know, we'll see if that if that continues. But uh, yeah, I mean the the slider was uh, the slider tonight was uh, eighty six. Uh, mm. Last year was about it was almost eighty nine was the mm. average on that pitch. The splitter, uh, the average was eighty two point five. Last year was eighty five point six. So, a couple pitches he throwing a lot softer than he did last year. Uh, fastball down a tick. That's probably just more about being early in the year than anything. So. Uh, nothing too concerning there, but you kind of look at uh, the the my favorite the splitter. Mm-hmm. He threw uh, he threw ten splitters, right? The maximum spin rate on his split, like the spl- the splitter that that rotated the most, eight hundred sixteen, yeah, uh, RPM wasn't the one that uh, that has been kind of making the rounds on social 451. media. Four fifty one. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was like four fifty, four sixty, something like that. The one yeah, four, to Yoshida, 451, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, <laughs> yeah, last year, uh, last year's average spin rate on that pitch was nine oh six. Today, mm-hmm. his average was six forty. Uh, now, spin rate on the fastball and a curveball typically good. Spin rate on change up and curve or change up and split. You want that down. You want that as mm-hmm. low as close to zero as you can get. It gets what gives the pitch the tumbling action. Uh, that makes it really tough to hit. And and Logan had a really good one. Didn't have much feel for it early in the game, but again, he really dialed it in. Yeah. Got a couple of big strikeouts uh, when he needed them uh, with that pitch. So the split, you know, kind of making the rounds. That'll be the pitch that you see on Pitching Ninja. But the slider was actually huge for Logan tonight. You know, it's interesting. We talked about this when he came up. Like, how is Logan Gilbert going to get lefties out? Because eventually he's not going to be able to do it with the fastball. A lot of lefties in Boston's lineup. Uh, and you know, tonight he went right after him with the slider and the fastball. Threw the slider and the fastball both 29 times tonight. Uh, both were really good pitches. He had a, a 34% called strike plus whiff on the fastball, 31% on the slider. Uh, neither pitch, the average exit velocity on uh, on both of those pitches were below 86 miles per hour. He was Ooh. really good tonight. Kind of kitchen sink, kind of leaning on what was working, but... It was fastball slider at equal at equal amounts. Dropped in the new cutter that we heard he was working yep. on, and, and threw a couple really good ones. Yeah. Uh, it looks like Logan Gilbert is has a, another viable big league offering. We'll see if he can do it again, but it looks like off a of first reaction, the cutter is like last year's splitter, where it's 
immediately good enough to use in big league games and get success off of it. So when you start to kind of look at what Logan's bringing to the table right now, four seamer, slider, cutter, splitter. And oh, by the way, he still has his curveball. He threw eight of them tonight. Uh, Again, not, not just, it's kind of a show me pitch. It's not something that's there to induce swing and misses, but it's a way to steal a strike early. It's there to put something in the back of the hitter's mind. He threw it 9% of the time tonight. You cannot dismiss that pitch when you're at the plate. Uh, and he throws it just enough uh, that it, it's it's there. It's something you have to be cognizant of. So really good outing from Logan tonight. Uh, he was fantastic. Uh, not the best we've seen him uh, in terms of stuff, but, man, when he got on the roll there and around the fourth inning, uh, he worked out of trouble. I think was it the third or the fourth. He worked out of a little bit of trouble, you mm. know, worked around it, and then he was just lights out for the rest of the night. Probably – in June, July, he's probably going back out there for the eighth. Only threw 91 pitches tonight. Yeah. Uh, he was he was very good. And the Mariners needed him to be very good. And he was. So, uh, great night for Logan Gilbert. So, we got to give a shout out to Austin Voth and Gabe Spire. <laughs> Spire was awesome. Uh, that, that slider that he threw to, I believe, Connor Wong was yeah. nasty. Spun him around. Yeah. Matt Brash versus Jose Ramirez. Right. High fives. Um, got a similar reaction out of Aaron Goldsmith, too. Oh, Goldie was uh, on fire tonight. Oh, he was. He was. Yeah. He was um, really good. Yeah. And uh, both, I mean, that's not really a, a guy that you would expect to come up huge in a, you know, in a high leverage spot. But uh, there you go. Right. And I mean, right now, while you're kind of having to patch things together and, you know, Munoz wasn't available after his four out save last night. Mm-hmm. Stanek probably wasn't available either, maybe in a break, you know, glass in case of an emergency situation, but otherwise, no. Um, you know, and with Santos and Brash out, you kind of have to get some unexpected uh, things like this. So the Mariners are going into tomorrow looking for a series win. Uh, and they're going to be wearing the Sunday creams, I would assume. So they're going to go for the uh, the Jersey cycle in this series. So that's that's kind of neat. Bryce Miller on the bump for his 2024 debut. We're going to get into that in just a moment. And you're listening to the Locked On Mariners podcast. Thank you again for making us your first listen after the Mariners 4-3 to victory over the Boston Red Sox and in extra innings tonight. So now the Mariners will go for a series win to start the season off tomorrow afternoon, and it's going to be Bryce Miller making his 20, 2024 debut against Garrett Whitlock. So, uh, Colby, what are your expectations and hopes for Miller tomorrow? Yeah, Miller's going to see every lefty the Red Sox have uh, to offer, and and they have a lot of them. Uh, they have quite a few good ones, and we'll see if Devers is back tomorrow. Obviously, the Red Sox. if he's not. <laughs> yeah, obviously the Red Sox lineup lacks a little bit of oomph when when yeah. Devers isn't in it. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just say it. It is significantly less scary with him is. out of it. <laughs> it is still make a lot of contact, still have a lot of speed, but Devers is the guy that you fear in that lineup. Yeah. He's the guy that you're always, you know, keeping circled. Like, okay, where is he at? Where is he at? Hmm. Um, so we'll see if Devers can play tomorrow. Um, you know, the, the Red Sox, like the Mariners have been very cautious with guys, uh, early in the season. Uh, Kenley Jansen had a bit of a back issue tonight. He was not available, uh, at all. That's why he didn't come in to close the game. Uh, obviously the Mariners have been very cautious with Mitch Carver and his back spasms. Uh, we'll see if he's in the game tomorrow, but yeah, it, regardless of Devers is going to play or not, every lefty is going to be in the lineup. Uh, tomorrow against uh, Miller, and that's that's been his bugaboo. That's been how you've you know beaten Bryce Miller is you get lefties in there, and he doesn't really have a pitch to counteract the lefties, at least good lefties. Now he's been working on a splitter. We've seen it a little bit here and there. Uh, to me, it looks like a useful changeup, but it doesn't look like a swing and miss pitch to me quite yet. Uh, there's still work to do on that pitch, so. I suspect he's still going to be pretty fastball heavy. Now, I do think he's going to make an effort, uh, a, like a conscious effort to throw the split and to throw the slider early in the game often and try to get those two pitches established. But, uh, you know, for Bryce Miller, and, until we see otherwise, he lives and dies by the fastball. He has to locate that pitch well. He has to get in off the plate. He has to get at the top rail. 
Um, and we'll see what the velocity is at. We saw him at times this spring be 97, 98, uh, which is you know where he needs to be. And we've seen him last year at times he was 93, 94. Uh, it's an effective fastball either way. It's a high spin rate pitch. Um, but again, you have to have more than your fastball, particularly against lefties. Lefties torched Miller last year. So that's going to be the key. How does he do against Casas? How does he do against Yoshida? How does he do? Hopefully not against Devers. <laughs> Uh, but I, I would guess Devers is going to be out, out there tomorrow, but who knows? It, again, it's early. Teams are going to be cautious. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how he handles the lefties. Does he just stick with the fastball? Is he just dead set on getting that splitter to be the out pitch against lefties? How he handles them will tell us a lot about how uh, he plans on attacking hitters uh, the rest of this year. So, um, you know, it, it's – it's a little bit of a of a like a surprise grab bag. You don't really know what's in it. You hope it's good. Could be, you know, could be nothing. Could just be kind of a mediocre outing. It could be great, and it would be awesome if it was great. You should have Stanek back tomorrow. You should have Munoz back tomorrow. Um, I imagine, uh, you know, Spire only threw like eleven pitches. Now he, do you want him to go three days in a row this early in the year? Eh, you know, maybe not, but. Uh, I, I do think that, you know, most of the bullpen should be good to go tomorrow. Haven't seen Colin Snyder. Where are you, bud? Uh, let's get him into a game. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think Miller uh, is going to try and get the splitter established early in this game. So I expect the first thing to see a lot of fastball up, split down, just to see how it looks and, and you know, see if he can get some uh, some weak contact, weak contact off of those pitches. Yeah, and like you mentioned, we'll see if Mitch Carver is back in the lineup. Uh, Scott service earlier today said that, uh, he wasn't feeling great when he woke up this morning. So they're going to just, you know, play it by ear, be pretty cautious with that. Um, you know, like you said, it's obviously very, very, very early in the season. Don't need to force anything. Uh, I know that, you know, service, especially last night, you know, has been managing these games a little bit more aggressively than he has, you know, previous March and April games, uh, in the past, but, uh, that would be pushing it a little too much to uh, to ask Garber to go out there if he's not feeling 100%. Yeah. I think he feels like he's already pushing Hanniger a little bit. Hanniger's played three days in a row. He did yeah. have a DH day in there, but yep. you know, it's, you're pushing it right with Mitch. So uh, mm-hmm. I, I kind of doubt Hanniger's going to be in the lineup tomorrow. I think we'll see Rayleigh and Canzone uh, both in there. And then my guess is you'll see like Urias. DH. You might see you might see Cal DH because I do expect Sebi to get yep. his first crack. Uh dig him after the night game. Cal's caught three games in a row. Zavala yep. is going to get the start behind the dish tomorrow. Yeah. Um, so I, I would suspect Hanniger is either at, I'd be shocked if Hanniger was in the lineup at all. But if he is, it's going to be as a DH. Um, I don't think they want to push that. Even even if Mitch is feeling great, right? You just you don't want to push that. Um, you got the series, you know, split at least. It's really hard to win these four game series. So it's nice that you got the two in your back pocket. Uh, you can get a little bit aggressive tomorrow, but you can also be smart. You can be smart mm-hmm. with your bullpen. You can be smart with the decisions on Bryce Miller. You could be smart on trying to keep both the Mitches healthy uh, throughout the year. So I, I, I my guess is tomorrow we're going to see Sebi uh, catching, and then we'll either see Raleigh DHing or mm-hmm. we're going to see uh, Urias DH or Rojas, one of those, whoever's not playing third will DH. Uh, that would be my guess. So we'll see what the lineup looks like tomorrow. We'll see if Garber's in it. You know, I, I doubt it. I think they're going to want to make sure that like he's in a really good spot and, and they don't think he's going to tweak anything. Uh, yeah. Sounds sound to me like based on the comments today, probably another day or two. So hopefully by the end of this homestand, he's back in there. Um, and again, there, there's just no reason to push him right now. It is, it is March 30th. Yeah. So there, there's just no reason to, just to be like, oh, well, no, no, he's healthy. We didn't sign, you know, a, an injury prone player. Like, right. that's not a thing. You can't be worried about that. You got to do what's best for the player. And by doing that, you're doing what's best for the team as well. You, mm-hmm. you want these guys playing well in September. Uh, you don't want to burn them out trying to win, you know, not meaningless games, but you don't want to burn them out in April and May. And then you need them in September. Like, sure. you got to be smart here. Well, that's going to do it for our show. But before we get out of here, once again, a reminder that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. 
Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Locked On Mariners postgame show. For Colby Patnode, I'm Ty Dane Gonzalez. Be sure to give us a follow on Twitter at LO underscore Mariners. You can follow me at Ty Dane Gonzalez and Colby at CPAT11. That's CPAT11. You can also find all that stuff in the description of this episode. Thank you again for making us your first listen. Have yourself a beautiful baseball day, and we'll see you next time. Peace.